Hello, pre-calculus students. Today we're going to learn about vectors. Sorry, I'm chewing my gum here. Vectors and dot products. Now we've already learned about vectors, spent a couple of lessons on that. I'm going to combine several lessons of dot products all into this one video. So it's going to be a long video. If you only need part of it, fast forward through till you're um, till you see what you what's new for you. So let's get started on vectors and dot products. <clears throat> All righty. So we've already learned how to add vectors. You add, I mean, if they're three-dimensional vectors, you add their first components. You add their second components. You add their third components. And now you have a resultant vector. If you multiply a vector by a scalar, you just multiply each of those components by that same scalar. Hmm. So adding vectors is pretty easy. Multiplying by a scalar is pretty easy. But what does it mean to multiply two vectors together? Does that have any meaning? And the answer is kind of, sort of. There are two types of vector multiplication. One's called the dot product, also known as the inner product or the scalar product. I'll use dot product. And when we do the dot product, a that's not a times b, we read this as a dot b to differentiate it from this one over here, which is a cross b. Well, the answer, when you, um, when you dot two vectors, you get a scalar, you get a number. When you cross two vectors, and this one's sometimes, this cross product is sometimes known as the vector product, you get a third vector that's perpendicular to both of these two. So if both of these two are on the paper, so if here's vector A and here's vector B, the cross product of them would be vector C sticking up out of the paper, maybe going down through the paper, one or the other but it would still be perpendicular to both of those. This is not covered in our textbook, but we will cover it in class. <clears throat> but let's spend some time on the dot product or scalar product. <clears throat> dot product is really easy. You multiply the first components together you multiply the second components together, and you add them. And as I said, A dot B will give you a number. So this is a number plus a number, give you a number, a scalar. So if we are having a vector in three space, multiply the first components, multiply the second components, multiply the third components, and add them. Now, this is why I said in class that our definition of a vector, it's not a very good one, this quantity with magnitude and direction. Because what does it mean to have magnitude and direction if your vector has 17 um, components? It's kind of silly. So anyway, the dot product, if you have longer vectors, is first components, multiply the second components, multiply the third components, all the way up to the nth components, and add all those products together. So nothing new, just an extension from this to n space. Obviously, um, whenever you dot vectors, both vectors have to have the same number of components. This was two, this was three, this was n. Dot products have a lot of properties. You can read those at the bottom of page 798 of your textbook, and I encourage you to do so. When you dot a vector with itself, you get the square of the magnitude of the vector. So let's say you have a vector 3, 4. Well, you know, three, four, five, right triangle, its magnitude is going to be five. Well, when you dot three to three and four to four, 
3 times 3 is 9, 4 times 4 is 16, 9 and 16 is 25. The magnitude is 5, that is, um, 25 is the magnitude squared. But let's prove this for all vectors, not just for a three um, for a vector of length five. So vector v is a horizontal and vertical components v one and v two. Its magnitude is this number. I shouldn't need to explain that. So let's dot it with itself. V one times v one, v two times v two. So that's v one squared. That's v two squared. And that's what you get if you square this magnitude, is just the magnitude without the square root. So this shows that when you dot a vector with itself, you do get the magnitude, the square of the magnitude of that vector. So that's my first lesson in dot products. <clears throat> Here's my second lesson. Let's find the acute angle between two vectors. And then we're also going to learn to define the word orthogonal. Actually, we're not going to define it. We're going to define it for our purposes, just like we defined a vector as a number or a quantity with magnitude and direction. That works for our purposes. It's not really what a vector is. We're going to define kind of sort of what orthogonal is. Now well, to just cover this up. <clears throat> okay, we have two vectors floating out in space. Remember, for our purposes, vectors just have magnitude and direction. So this one's over here. This one could be over here. But if we put them together, tail to tail, we're, we create two angles. You have this angle in here that is less than 180 degrees. And you have this angle out here that is greater than 180 degrees. If these are my two vectors, if I put them together tail to tail, this angle in here is the one that's less than 180 degrees. This angle out here is greater than 180 degrees. Now it turns out that we can find that acute angle not acute. It's less than 180 degrees, not less than 90, my bad. By using this formula. So if I have two vectors, here's vector u, well, here's vector u, and here's vector v. u goes up and to the right, v goes up and, yeah, v goes down and to the right. You put them together tail to tail, they look like this. Here's our angle theta that is less than 180 degrees. This smaller angle theta can be found using this formula. You take vector u, dot it with vector v, and divide it by the product of their magnitudes. And theta will always be in the first or second quadrants because that's where arc cosine gets us. There we go. Two vectors are orthogonal if their dot products are zero. Now think of it this way. Their dot product is zero. Then if you go back to that last formula, then cosine theta has to equal zero. Because if neither A nor B is the zero vector, in this case U and B, then if the dot product is zero, zero divided by some quantity will be zero. Cosine theta is zero at 90 degrees. So if a dot product is zero and neither of those two vectors are zero, then theta is 90 degrees. So what that means is that vectors that are perpendicular to each other have a dot product of zero. Now perpendicular makes sense in two dimensions. These two vectors are, whoop, these two pins are perpendicular to each other. If I move them like this, they're, they're still perpendicular to each other and they form a plane. You see, they just stay perpendicular to however I rotate that plane. 
But what would have been, what if I had vectors in three space, you know, the, or seven space, you know, vectors with seven components? Then they aren't really perpendicular anymore. But orthogonality is just um, one way to think of it is think of perpendicularity just extended to higher dimensions. So if you have two vectors that are uh, two vectors, in a plane that are perpendicular to each other, their dot product will be zero. Three space, four space, five space. If the dot product is zero, then we don't say they're perpendicular, we say they're orthogonal. And that's as much as I'm going to define orthogonality. Right now is vectors are orthogonal, which can be thought of as perpendicular if their dot product is zero. That's the second lesson. Now let's do the third one. Third one's a bit harder. <laughs> let's see. Okay. <laughs> now we're going to project one vector onto another. I oh, didn't change this. This should be v onto w so when we project a vector onto another think of it like a shadow a perpendicular shadow so why don't i do it this way because this way isn't perpendicular to w so if i project this shadow of v onto w the projection has to be perpendicular to w and you can see that this component right here is the projection of vector v onto vector w. Now I'm going to show you something here. Oh, look, don't copy, just listen. <clears throat> I'm going to break vector u up into two components. One that's parallel to v and one that's perpendicular to V. And this is V right here, this little one. So I'm going to break vector U up into two parts, W1 and W2. W1 is this distance. W2 is or number one. W1 is this vector. W2 is this vector. Well, since W1 is in the direction of V, it's parallel to V, it's just some multiple of B, some constant multiple of B plus W2. So there we go. Now, if I take U and dot it with V, well, vector U is this one, which came from right here. Dot it with V. You can go to page 798 and see that when you, um, that this, that I did this correctly, this is one of those properties of dot products. So constant v dot v plus w2 dot v. Well, w2 dot v is zero because we defined w2 as being perpendicular to v. Or it's perpendicular to w2. I'm sorry. w2 is perpendicular to w1 and w1 is parallel to v. So v dot v has got to be the magnitude of v squared. And W2 dot V, since they're perpendicular, has got to be zero. So we can now solve for C, and we get this formula. So C tells us how many times V this is. So if we're going to project U onto V, this is the projection onto V of a vector U. Then this W1 is that projection, which is this constant C times V. So U dot V divided by V dot V times vector V. So that's a number, that's a number, number divided by a number is a number. So it's just some constant 
times vector v. That's w. That's w1. Then how do you get w2? In just a second, checking my next slides to make sure I covered that. Okay, I did, but it's a few slides from now. Quite simply, you would go u minus um, w1. So there's u. If w1 is this way, negative w1 would be this way. And then you could find u2 or w2. So if this is vector v and this is u, the projection onto vector v of vector u is given by this formula. <laughs> now I've, re I've written it differently here. This time I projected w or projected vector v onto w, but you'll notice. If I'm projecting it onto W, I've got to have some multiple of W. Over here, I was projecting it onto V, I have some multiple of vector V. So however you um, choose to remember that, if this, if we're projecting something onto vector W, all of this is W, this is the only other one that isn't. And you could remember that that magnitude squared is just um, w dot w. So again, all of this is all of these are w's except that one. So to break a vector into perpendicular components, maybe you don't want it horizontal and vertical. Maybe you need it like this, where it's not horizontal, but you still need two parts perpendicular. <laughs> Well, if that's V and that's W, if we want a perpendicular, let's see, we'll write vector V as the sum of two vectors, one parallel to W and one perpendicular to W. So we'll project V onto W, and we'll call it V1, and then perpendicular will be V2. So V1, we already know is this. So if this is V1 here, then to get V2 to get this, we just do the original vector V minus V1 would get you this vector, which is the same as this vector would be V2, as I've drawn it here. Well, this isn't that fun. Now, here's a little practical application. We've all learned since we were children the idea of an inclined plane. And an inclined plane makes things easier to do. You trade um, distance for force. If I needed to lift a 100-pound weight and just lift it up there, maybe I'm weak. Maybe I can't do that. But if I had a ramp, I could put it in this wagon that reduces the friction so I'm not dragging it but I put it in this wagon and I can pull it up here now granted this distance here is shorter than this distance but I don't need a hundred pounds or the force to pull it up the ramp anymore how much do I need well if it's a hundred pound weight in the wagon let's just draw a vector directly downward that's 100 pounds. It's directly downward because that's how gravity acts. That's how weight acts. Now I need to break this vector into two components. One component perpendicular to the ramp and one component parallel to the ramp. So here's my perpendicular part. Here's my parallel part. The perpendicular part doesn't have any effect on how much effort I need to use to pull it up the ramp. Like I said, this, think of this as you know frictionless or something. We're just rolling the wagon up the ramp. So all I really need to know is how much of this 100 pounds is acting down the ramp. So let's go through this. 
Remember, this was perpendicular to the ground. If this is a 30 degree angle and this is 90, then this in here must be 60. And if we zoom in, this vertical angle over here must be 60. We said this one was perpendicular. Yeah, I'll zoom in now. So if this is 60 and this is 60 and this is 90, then this angle up here must be 30 degrees. And I wrote it down here because it's too tiny to write up here. So this angle up here is the same 30 degrees as this angle here. Uh -huh. So the, since this is a right triangle, the sine of 30 degrees is opposite over hypotenuse y over 100 pounds. Multiply both sides by 100, you have 50 pounds. So what that means is rather than lifting the weight, the 100 pound weight, this distance, I can use only 50 pounds of force pulling it up this way, and that'll counteract the 50 pounds of force this way. And the wagon can move at a constant velocity. Once we've overcome inertia and got it moving, the wagon can move at a constant velocity up this ramp while we use only 50 pounds of force. As I said, we're trading um, pounds for distance here because 100 pounds, I'd only have to go this distance. But 50 pounds, I'm gonna go up a longer distance. Let's do that problem another way. And a problem like this will be on the chapter test. So let's do it a different way. Let's just say, I'm gonna say I got vector W here. And I have this 100 pound weight going in the negative direction. So it's, you could write that vector as zero comma negative 100 or negative 100 J. And I want to know what component of this vector U is acting parallel to the W. So that would be this V1 vector here. Well, if it's, I could write vector W as cosine of 30 degrees I, because I mean, vector W is just all I really need is a direction. So let's make it a unit vector. Um, cosine 30 degrees in the X direction sine 30 degrees in the y direction. So I could write vector w this way. And vector v1 is gonna, you can tell it's going in the opposite direction of w. And again, I don't need to worry about this perpendicular one because this perpendicular one isn't speeding up or slowing down my wagon at all. Only the, only the component of the vector in this direction is um, affecting the wagon. So here's u dot w divided by w dot w times w. Well, u dot w is fifth negative 50. w dot w is 1. Well, you knew that anyway. It's a unit vector, and 1 squared would be 1. And then we're going to multiply that by this vector. So it turns out that since this is 1, it's just this vector is negative 50 times the original unit vector, which means it's 50 units um, long or 50 pounds of force going in the opposite direction of this vector. So it's acting in this way. You'll notice we still got the negative 50 pounds acting in that direction. This formula is given to you in your textbook. Magnitude of a force dot a distance or times a distance. And here's another way of writing it. You can dot two vectors or you could multiply their magnitudes together. And I'll show you what that means. This is my last slide. I'm sure that really bums you out. Something happened. 
why I did my screen sharing pause. Oh, okay, there. So just to make sure you got that, not you at least heard me talk about it. And then, so let's say that we've got a barn door on a rail and the barn door slides this way. So we open the barn door, close the barn door. But I'm not sliding it. I'm grabbing it. I got a rope tied to the end of the barn door, and I'm pulling it down at this in this direction of 300 degrees. Now, there's no part of the barn that's moving down. The barn door is just going to be sliding to the right. So how much work am I doing? I take, um, I went from vec point P to point Q, so that's, this vector. And you can see that the force I'm applying is 50 pounds in the direction of 300 degrees. So it's 50 cosine 300 degrees, 50 sine 300 degrees. So this is my force vector. And let's say I'm moving vector from here to here, I'm moving the door 12 feet. So I went 12 feet in the X direction, zero feet in the Y direction. So let's dot these two vectors. There's my 300 feet. All right, sorry, 300 foot pounds, not 300 feet, foot pounds. It's funky unit of measurement that goes back to the uh, British imperial system. So what you really need to know of this lesson. Ooh, there we go. Well, these three lessons actually. First, you need to know what a dot product is, or at least how to calculate it. And oh, got it here. This was the page where we talked about how to calculate a dot product. What is a dot product good for? Well, we can find the angle between two vectors. That was this formula, this page. And we also know that if two vectors are orthogonal, then their dot products are zero. And if their dot products are zero, then they're orthogonal. You should also know how to project one vector onto another. If we're projecting this U onto vector V, then everything over here is vector V except for this first one that you're um, projecting onto V. Same here, we're, yeah, we're projecting U onto V. So everything's V except for that U. Here we're projecting V onto W. So everything's a W except for that V that you're projecting. And that whole idea of projection enables us to break vectors into perpendicular components, and that helps us solve physics problems. So that's all I've got for now. Oh, did that right. That's all I've got for now. Have a great day.